So we are now on chapter 12, the Renaissance and Reformation. And by the way, this was an entire uh, semester course for me in college. So obviously you guys have a lot to squeeze in in one chapter. Just as an overview for section one, so you know what's in there, the Renaissance began with an emergence of a secular urban society in a wealthy city-states of Italy. Milan, Venice, and Florence were particularly prosper prosperous trading centers. Italy's riches uh, prompted France to invade. Spain came to Italy's defense, leading to war and Spanish domination. It was in this context that the writer Machiavelli developed his famous thesis on political power. Most people in Europe were peasants, but serfdom continued to decrease. Nobles held considerable power in the towns and the cities. There were clear divisions between classes ranging from the wealthy and influential patricians to the burghers uh, to the miserably poor. During this period, Johannes Gutenberg produced the first printed Bible. And I'm proud to say that I saw that but I saw one of those Bibles while I was in Washington, D.C. Now this first section, chapter one, talks about the Italian Renaissance. If you guys can look at that picture down to the lower left and concentrate as I read. The term Renaissance means rebirth. Uh, it happened in urban, which means cities, society, and was an age of recovery after the plagues. Remember, the plagues kind of killed everybody off. The decline of the church had happened as well. Individual ability was emphasized. People that could do many things were praised, and that's where the concept of liberal arts education came from. Italian city-states, um, unlike having Rome as the center of civilization in Italy, other cities became important during the Renaissance. Italy had, Italy had city-states again. Remember, they had it before and we've got it again. So if you look, we have Milan, Venice, and Florence. And so those are the three areas, and you do have a question on this. Milan is in northern Italy. Uh, Francesco Forza, Sforza took over. He was a paid fighter, which is a mercenary, and had a good tax system in that city. Um, let's see, in Venice, they had an elected doge, but that doge didn't have much power. Trade was important, and the government was really run by the merchants. In Florence, merchants also ran the government, and of course, this is where we see the de Medici's. You can see entire uh, documentaries done on the de Medici family, especially Cosimo uh, and Lorenzo. A preacher named Savonarolo <laughs> came into power by criticizing wealth, and of course he does this when Lorenzo is dying, after placing strict rules on the people. It's really interesting because he brings about the burning of several books. It's called Bonfire of the Vanities, and then he himself is later burned. So very two famous, very uh, two very famous burnings just for him. He lost power and was sentenced to death for heresy. And then in the Italian wars, they were fought between France and Italy. The soldiers were mercenaries, which means they were paid. Spain ended up in Italy as a dominant force, which kind of seems strange. So if you look at this section right here, we have um, Nicole... Um, Niccolo Machiavelli and it's very very famous you guys will read an excerpt of this in your questions Italian politics were described best in Niccolo Machiavelli's book The Prince showing how to acquire and keep political power a quote is one can make this generalization about men they are ungrateful fickle fickle liars and deceivers they shun danger and are greedy for profit uh, let the conscience sleep if you are in politics. He abandoned morality in politics as well. Now, what's interesting about Niccolo Machiavelli is that many people quote him, whether it's Lenin or um, other groups. Sometimes he seems very democratic. Sometimes he seems very communist. So just as an interesting person as he basically wrote the prince uh, trying to attain power within that area. Renaissance society, there were three social classes during medieval times, and then as you can see, we have the nobility who owned land. Only 3% of the population were actually uh, within nobility. Uh, Baldassare Castiglion, the book of the courtier, um, they believe that you are born and not made. 
military fitness and education of course were very much a part of the nobility and you had to hide achievements but show them with grace okay you should serve the prince um, nobility so not the book as you saw to the left but the actual nobility peasants and townspeople made up 85 to 90 percent of the people rent was paid to the landlord instead of service and food as done during medieval time townspeople were merchants and artisans so you could see patrician the shopkeepers uh, workers and unemployed a family and marriage arranged marriages there was a dowry which meant that there was marriage for the females or money for the females when you got married men were the center women were um, held no wealth and a father's authority was absolute until he died or gave freedom believe it or not before a judge so that's how freedom had to be given okay now we're going to go on to section two of your chapter 12 Humanism was a key to intellectual movement in the Renaissance, focusing on the study of ancient Greek and Roman classics. While early humanists emphasized solitary learning, 15th century humanists stressed intellectualism in the service of the state. Humanism encouraged the use of classical Latin. However, European writers such as Dante and Chaucer wrote in vernacular, meaning common language of the people. Humanist schools taught a broad range of liberal studies. Renaissance artists sought to imitate nature but also to make human beings the focus of their work their painting sculptures and architecture were among the revolutionary achievements of renaissance art some say the best ever seen ever in world and u.s history some renaissance artists including michelangelo and leonardo da vinci produced masterpieces in all three disciplines artistic developments in italy were major influences on art in northern europe now these people are amazing and so we go on to section two before we look at what they actually did italian renaissance humanism study of classics from greece and rome petrarch the father of the italian renaissance because he did more than any others he used classical latin from reading you can see a picture of that i included it he felt a humanist should live in solitude that doesn't sound like fun the vernacular language if you look to the right this goes over one question in your um, question in your um, review. It is the spoken language in your region. Um, Dante's Divine Comedy, which is a soul's journey to salvation from hell to purgatory to heaven. A quote from there is the devil is as is not as black as he is painted. Uh, and then we have Christine de Pizan. She was a French woman who denounced men saying that women can't learn. She didn't believe that. Obviously, she was right. Should I also tell you whether a woman's nature is clever or quick enough to learn speculative sciences as well as to discover them? And likewise, the martial art, the, uh, sorry, manual arts, I assure you that women are equally well suited and skilled. Education in the Renaissance, like I said, was liberal studies, history, moral philosophy, eloquence, grammar and logic, poetry, mathematics, astronomy, and music. Educate to follow virtue and wisdom. It lasted until the 20th century, believe it or not, to make complete citizens, not great scholars. Women, unfortunately, did not really have the opportunity to attend schools. Now, the artists of this time were great many and amazingly talented. So you look at the right and you can see we start at the top, um, specifically look at Jan van Eyck uh, in Flanders. Um, the artistic renaissance in Italy does extend all the way north to Flanders and even in England. New techniques in painting, fresco painting done with fresh wet plaster with water-based paints, another question. Um, they do have depth. I gave it a 3D effect when you paint with plaster. Painting could be technical. They believe, believe it or not, used geometry and anatomy in order to be extremely specific in their painting. And then in sculpture and architecture, realism of uh, taking hard stone marble and giving it movement was amazing. Donatello copied Greek classics. Uh, Bernicecchi, an architect, also was inspired by classical Roman buildings. So you can see um, mentioned, of course, on here are many of the famous ones that you should recognize. Raphael, Michelangelo, M Michelangelo um, Da Vinci. Uh, so many of the, and Donatello to the right, many of those Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, of course, are represented in this map. 
Renaissance art itself was the art's a reflection of new humanist spirit. Medieval artists real, um, idealized the symbolic representation. Renaissance artists depicted what they actually observed in nature. Patrons of the arts um, and competition amongst the patrons. So basically, patrons were people that paid for the art. Medieval times, anonymous artists who worked for the church created art. Renaissance artists worked for whoever offered the highest price, as we all would. Uh, buyers of art, patrons, might be wealthy individuals, city government officials, or the church. Competition amongst patrons, wealthy individuals competed, uh, uh, yes, competed displaying wealth, uh, modernity um, through purchases of artworks. Florence, Lorenzo de' Medici, as we talked about before, supported most talented artists. He actually had Michelangelo live with him. Milan, the ruling Sforza family, um, benefactors of artists and others. Renaissance artists wanted to paint the natural world as realistic as possible. Now, pay attention. So here we have Jan van Eyck, and you can see just how amazing he is. He, of course, is the first to use oil paint, and you can just imagine the depth that you can just see in the color and how amazing this is. Remember, when they were using paints, they had to get minerals. They had to grind them up, and then they uh, had to make their own paints and their own brushes quite often, and so you can imagine how much um, talent it took. It wasn't like going down to Aaron Brothers and purchasing all of the necessary uh, accoutrement in order to paint. And so this is amazing to see the detail through these uh, faces as you look at them. Make sure you can identify them because this is a part of your review. Here we have Leonardo da Vinci. Again, another genius of his time. And you can see a self-portrait in the upper right-hand corner and uh, two very famous paintings, The Last Supper and The Mona Lisa. And then of course, you could see his anatomical designs that he was able to identify and um, take note. He studied anatomy in order to do this and he was quite the inventor. You can see his drawings and depictions of a helicopter as he thought that the helicopter might look like if it was invented. And Michelangelo, his works, of course, have the ability to just take your breath away. He's so amazing. He painted the Sistine Chapel. It took approximately four years. Um, you can see David. Believe it or not, you can see a replica of David down at Caesar's Palace. Um, and then you can see these others. Moses, if you can look at the detail of Moses' beard, that's rock. Imagine that he made rock flow like that. It's just astonishing. And then further to the left, again, is the Sistine Chapel. So please make sure that you can identify those pictures. And here we have Raphael. Painted many versions of the Virgin Mary. Um, of course, you can see the coronation of the Virgin to the left. And to the right, I've actually shown you this picture before when we were talking about Greece. It is the School of Athens, though, of course, it was painted by Raphael during the Renaissance. So it just seems amazing that we were going to summarize some of the best artists in the world that the world has ever seen in such a short period of time. Unfortunately, though, we have to go on. Here we are in section three. The Renaissance with its rebirth almost brought about the opposite effect within the Catholic faith where you almost had a rebellion through all of the education that was taking place. And that is called the Protestant Reformation. Changes in intellectual thought set the stage for the Protestant Reformation. Christian human, humorists Humanists, such as Erasmus, were critical of church corruption and said the church had become involved in politics rather than matters of the spirit. It's actually true. The widespread selling of indulgences prompted a monk and professor in Germany named Martin Luther to issue his famous 95 theses criticizing church abuses. Luther also rejected some Catholic doctrines. Luther's movement sparked a religious revolution felt all the way through today. 
many German states became key allies for Luther as he broke with the Catholic Church and established a new religion which became known as Lutheranism. The Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire was ultimately forced by the Peace of Augsburg to let German states choose between Catholicism and Lutheranism. I have to disagree a little bit with your summary about separate religions. I believe it is one religion practiced in many different ways. So if you look at this, uh, chapter 12, section 3, Erasmus and Christian Humanism. Again, humanism is the concept that humans could respond and improve themselves. Uh, De Sirius Erasmus was a famous humanist who started the philosophy as Christ. It was a movement. Christianity should show people how to live good lives on a daily basis rather than provide a system of beliefs that people have to practice to be saved. Uh, external church practices were not important. In other words, he helped to bring about the thought that pilgrimages, fasts, and relics um, he sought did not bring about salvation. He sought reform in the Catholic Church, but did not break away. Religion on the eve of revolution or reformation, corruption in the Catholic Church was rampant. In fact, you bought one of the de Medici's bought a cardinal position that almost broke the de Medici family. Popes were too concerned with politics. Uh, while the people wanted salvation, people thought they could gain indulgences, which is release of punishment from sin, from relics. Notice a relic down to your right there. Uh, other people sought salvation through mystical movements such as the modern devotion that downplayed religious dogma but stressed the teachings of Jesus. So you can see there was a lot of thought. So here we have Martin Luther, and he, of course, was complaining about the church. He thought, wait, stuff is wrong. i got to change this stuff. And he wanted to just, you know, complain out loud. So he wrote these 95 complaints and ended up hammering him to a door. So I guess that's the equivalent of blogging these days. And uh, he basically said that indulgences, which were something granted as a favor or privilege, were wrong. Um, you don't have to pay to have sins forgiven. The Catholic Church at the time said, hey, you cannot have salvation, go to heaven, without faith and works, which works, of course, is doing good deeds. And we're needed for salvation. And Luther said, Luther said, forget it. No way. It doesn't say that in the Bible. So uh, as far as needed for salvation, faith alone, you're saved by grace. And so he wanted to complain about that. But he kind of was a small scale thinker as far as that goes and just was looking to have some changes done in the German area in Germany. But um, change swept through everywhere. Charles V, who was also Charles I of Spain, amazing person that could have two names in the same area. Um, he wanted to keep the empire Catholic, but uh, just due to all of the revolts that were taking place, he was unable to do that. And it ended up being something left to the choice of the people in Germany. So look at this map and just pay attention to it as I read, because this map is actually found in your review as well. You can see, uh, believe it or not, the center there of the map is the Holy Roman Empire. You can see the German states, Denmark, Norway, Sweden. Those are all areas that, of course, are Lutheran. Okay? Now the Catholic areas, you can see Poland, Hungary, France, Spain, Portugal, and um, those uh, areas. And you can see um, England kind of goes back and forth at this time because it depends on whether we're under Henry VIII who makes it the Church of England slash Anglican then his son comes to power keeps it that way then his daughter Bloody Mary who wants to kill everybody who's not Catholic uh, she makes it Catholic again and then her half sister Queen Elizabeth makes it Anglican again so England's kind of fickle goes back and forth but uh, you can see that the areas that are Lutheran then of course you can see the areas that are Catholic um, Muslim areas way down to the right there by the Ottoman Empire, that of course being Turkey. So, the significance of Gutenberg's printing press caused the explosion of printed materials. By 1500, 40,000 titles printed between 
eight and 10 million copies. So basically the Bible is the number one seller at this time. But not only that, this movable type where they could take the letters out and reprint things instead of having to hand copy everything becomes this amazing explosion of ideas. Okay, so the ability to print ends up being this amazing explosion of ideas because it puts in the hands of the everyday reader something that they might not have had their hands on. They might have had to go to university to get, but now they're able to get it in the streets or at some other location. And so that helped to spread uh, these new ideas around Europe. And we are on the last section of your chapter. Section four, which only consists of basically two slides minus the summary. So section four, the spread of Protestantism. The vision of Protestantism appeared in Switzerland under the leadership of Ulrich Zwilly and then John Calvin. Calvinist belief in predestination spurred missionaries to spread their faith. In England, the Reformation was based on the political need of Henry VIII to remarry and produce a male heir. Although Queen Mary later tried to reverse the break with the Catholic Church, by the end of her reign, Protestantism was firmly entrenched. Anabaptists believed in the complete separation of the church and state and were regarded as dangerous radicals. The Catholic Reformation revitalized the Catholic Church through the Jesuits, the reform of the papacy, and the Council of Trent. And so just as a summary of that, to make sure that you understand this, and again, another way to um, answer questions in your review, look at this. We have Ulrich Zwilly, so you can see, or Zwingli, sorry. In Switzerland, he believed that relic, he had relics and images removed and abolished. He was unable to agree with Luther on the meaning of communion. So the Catholic Church believes that when you take communion, you take the actual blood and body of Christ, where Protestants believe that you take the representation of it more like eating the last supper john calvin and calvinism believed that god was big enough to determine our future as an all-powerful nature of god predestination god said we were saved in advance you guys can find all of this information of course in section four in your book as you follow along we are on page 397 and 396 and 397 Henry VIII, Church of England, the king wanted to divorce his wife. So when you're king, guess what you do? You're king. Change the rules. Um, so he was married to a Catholic and decided that he didn't want to be. He wanted to marry Anne Boleyn and hopefully have a son. Guess what? He didn't. She gave birth to Elizabeth, and his first wife, first wife had given birth to Mary. Um, he didn't want to wait for the annulment, so he started a new church, the Anglican religion, the Church of England. The Anabaptists believed in voluntary community of adult believers who had undergone a spiritual rebirth and had then been baptized. They believed in adult baptism, unlike child baptism of other faiths. And then Ignatius of Loyola, sorry, they were Jesuits, the state a part of the Catholic Church, um, part of the Catholic Reformation, and they swore allegiance to the Pope. So I hope that you guys can understand the basic um, areas of Protestantism as broken down by that section in section 4 of chapter 12 of your book. This particular picture may be a little bit hard to see, but it is just basically a summer, summary of the chapter with the Italian um, experiences of artistic, intellectual, um, and commercial awakening. You can see Venice and Florence. And then in England, Flanders, and France, we have ideas quickly spread from Italy through Northern Europe. Reformers began... Um, reformers began to challenge both secular and religious rules in Germany, England, and Switzerland, and then the Catholic Church enacts reforms in Italy. So I hope you guys understood this chapter. If you have any questions, please email me.